Yeah. Ed Gardner is just the most knowledgeable on tax stuff that I've ever heard. That's why I'm also recording it because he talks fast and he's got a lot of knowledge and a lot of good stuff to say. And so we're going to send it back to y'all also. So you can have this for after, but he's got a master's degree, CFP, PFS, CPP, all these acronyms that are just amazing education. Um, He owns his own firm. How long now, Ed, have you owned, owned your own, your own gig years and years, 30, over 30 years. Awesome. He's written a book. He's got a movie coming out that he's going to talk to us about Uh, at some point. He'll tell you it's really cool. And he's on, you know, he's been on TV, news channels. Um, He's definitely the resident expert. So with that, I'm going to stop sharing Ed, and then you can just go ahead and share your screen and let us know whatever we got to know about 2021 taxes. Good morning, everyone. You know, when someone makes a presentation, sometimes, especially on Zoom, we don't always pay attention the whole time. And so a presentation to me is like a coloring book. I don't know if you could see, but you could take no mental notes. But you know, when someone gives a presentation, it's like a coloring book. They give an outline. So today I'm going to give you an outline of things that you need to know about your taxes. But also, I I thought I'd start out with a few marketing tips. And, you know, one thing that we do with the coloring book is that we color. So today I hope that you'll listen to me so that we can help save you some money on your taxes. But, you know, a few marketing tips uh, that I'd like to share at first is one you might want to write down 10 to 1130 and 2 to 330 are the best times to be on the phone. And when you're on the phone, I recommend that you stand up. You tend to project better when you stand up. And something that you might consider doing is if maybe your year's starting out a little slow, why don't you maybe go through your list of contacts that you've had for the last five years and maybe give them a call saying, you know, with the virus, I was thinking about you and I wanted to see how you and your family are doing. And uh, of course, what have you been up to? They're going to ask you what you're doing and you can refresh them about you working with real estate. And another marketing tip I want to give is that when you talk to people, watch their eyes. You know, if someone looks up, they're visual. And we a lot of times want to communicate how we feel comfortable. We need to do a paradigm shift and communicate how the person you're talking to. So if they look up, a person's visual. If they look straight at you, they're audible. And you have people that tend to do this. And they look down and they look back up. It's not that they're not listening to you. They're what's known as kinesthetic, touchy-feely, caring, emotional person. So you want to talk with emotion. Now, you're probably saying, how is this going to help me? And if a person was going to not tell the truth to you, nine out of 10 times, if they tend to look to their right, which is your left, they're lying to you. One out of four times, they're ADD. So you can't base it on the first look. So let's start talking a little bit about you being an exceptional realtor. Starting out with, there's some information you might want to share with the person that you're listing a house for or a person that's buying is that they're moving from their old house to a new house. Well, IRS over the last three years, should they come back and contact a person needing more information or they want to potentially audit them, they're going to send any correspondence to their old address. So at the back of the handout that you were given, there's a form 8822. That's change of address. That's something that you would mail in to Austin. For those of you that work with businesses, it's a form 8822-B. And again, that's in the back of your handouts. Now, something you might suggest to both the seller and the buyer is that they get a copy of the settlement statement. Of course, the seller, the one that they originally had with the house. And if they refinance, get that. And go around the house and make a list of any improvements they've done. Maybe they redid a bathroom, a kitchen. Maybe they put up a fence, a new AC, a water heater, a roof. All this goes into the cost of the home. Under current tax law, if you're in a home two out of five years, and if someone's in the military two out of seven years, you can make a profit, if you're single, of 250000 If you're married, it's 500000 And of course, to help lower that game would be the extra expenses that you had at closing, at the purchase, and also the improvements. Another thing is dealing uh, with your record keeping. IRS 
has nine circuits. We're in what's called the Houston district. They like pieces of paper. So you might recommend to people that they start a folder on their house and any improvements that they've done, that they put copies of the receipts. And likewise, on the expenses that you have in your day-to-day -day operation as a realtor, you might need to keep a copy of the receipts. And I recommend that you get a folder and you keep it on every vendor that you have. You know, you might say, well, Ed, it's easier for me to throw everything into the January uh, folder of the expenses I incurred in January. Well, should you get looked at by the IRS, IRS is going to want you to prove up the receipts, for example, for your cell phone, for your internet. So you got to go through a lot of folders. You got to go through a lot of envelopes. You got to go through a lot of paper to get all the bills on just your cell phone or your internet. So if you have a separate folder on each, you have all the information on each expense that you have. And when you have things, especially like with entertainment, you have the who, what, where, when, why. And three of them are taken care of when you have a receipt. So for example, who, it might be John and Mary Doe. What is how much, where? Maybe you took them to Houston's. When? February 3rd, 2022. Why? A potential customer referral source discussing buying homes in the XYZ neighborhood. So it's important that you, again, keep those receipts. Now, some people do records different ways. Uh, one example is with QuickBooks. Uh, a lot of people have used that. Some people may do an Excel uh, spreadsheet. And I encourage you, don't wait to the end of the year to try to add up everything. You want to do it early in the year. So you want to try to do it maybe weekly, if no longer than monthly. Because if I asked you on a receipt, where were you? At this time, three weeks ago, most people don't remember. So the same way you may have receipts that don't have all that information. Now, IRS, should they audit you, they're going to look at your calendar. So I recommend that you make sure that you keep your calendar and that you make sure how you record things. You don't want to say that you took someone out for a meal and in your calendar it said uh, wife's birthday anniversary, boyfriend, girlfriend, you know, whatever the case might be. Now, on your deductions, IRS wants it to be ordinary and necessary. So if you're making 50000 a year and you go have a $1,500 mill, that's not ordinary and necessary for the income level that you're at. You want to be able to document everything. And of course, I have to share with you that you, ha you can't cheat on your return because the IRS can hit you with penalties and also potentially go into prison. Now, when you work with someone on your tax return, there are a lot of people that start doing tax returns, of course, at tax filing season. Make sure that they're familiar with the realtor. Of course, we would love to help you uh, with your returns, but whoever you use, make sure that they've worked on returns for realtors and make sure that they keep current with the law. Ask them not only what they do during tax time, but what they do to keep current on the tax law. Your different expenses, I'm going to kind of go alphabetical, and I'll, some of them I may skip through, but we'll start out with, uh, of course, any form of advertising you do. You put up signs, flags, maybe you put ads in print material, maybe you do something with radio, TV. Now, if you do do something like radio, TV, whatever, you can't just do it once. You need to commit to do it for at least three to six months. There is repetition is everything, and that's what they do to hear you. Some of you may have an answering service. Some of you may have an answering machine. Those expenses would also be deductible. You may have some sellers that don't want to pay for the appraisal fee, and you pay out of pocket. Now, if you are a W-2 employee, the expenses that I'm talking about now, you cannot deduct. But if you are a 1099 person, a contract labor uh, person, then these expenses that I'm talking about, these are things that you can deduct. You may, of course, incur your hard do, nor dues, your MLS dues. You may uh, be a member of the Chamber of Commerce. So these type of expenses, they are deductible. Now, sometimes when you go to sell a home, you may offer to pay uh, for paperwork with an attorney or maybe have them consult with the CPA. Those expenses are deductible. 
In fact, when you sell a home, there may be some times when someone has done their own tax return and the underwriter requires a letter for an independent CPA that they have filed a return and they've been self-employed for two or more years. If you need help with that, our firm does uh, prepare those tax letters, uh, that are re those letters that are required by the underwriter. So if you need help, please feel free to give us a call. Now, when you talk about your automobile, there's a couple methods that you can use, but on all methods, you need to put down your odometer reading January 1st every year or January 2nd, and of course, at the end of the year. Now, in my example I'm going to give now, I'm going to give it uh, using whole numbers, but IRS, if on your return you say you drove exactly 10,000 miles, they probably know that you're not keeping a good track. And in keeping record of your automobile, of course, you can manually write it down. Now, some people have used different uh, apps. Uh, one that I have heard from a lot of people they use, and I'm not just pushing them, is one called Mile LQ. Of course, if you do something personal, you go get a haircut, go to the grocery store, whatever, on that type of app, if you uh, push it to one direction, let's say to the left, that's personal. But then you may go to a meeting, you may go to a listing, you may go to the title company for closing. The, those expenses are business related and that'll help you keep a record. And of course they could tie that to your car. And I recommend at the end of the month that you print those off, that you don't just have it on the internet. So one method is the miles. Under uh, changes in the law, mileage rates now for 2022 have dropped to 56 cents a mile. So it just, again, in my example, if you drove 10,000 miles, that would be a deduction on your tax return of 56 cents a mile or 5,600 in that example. Another method is you take your actual expense, your gas, your oil, your insurance, your repairs, um, uh, your uh, tags that you have and with those expenses you look at the percentage so again in my example let's say the odometer was ten thousand to begin the year forty thousand the end of the year you drove thirty thousand miles total but you drove only fifteen thousand for business well in that example is fifty percent so if all those expenses added up for example to ten thousand dollars fifty percent of that would be five thousand on the actual expenses and of course, you can include depreciation in that figure uh, for your auto expense. Now, if you have parking and tolls, those are additional expenses. And those are expenses that you can deduct in addition to either the mile mileage rate or the actual rate. Of course, if you have a separate bank account and they charge bank charges or you have wire fees, things like those, those are deductible. Some of you may not want to do your own record keeping and you decide to do uh, an outside person where they do bookkeeping. And by the way, if you have anyone that is contract labor, the bookkeeping, or maybe you have a handy person that to sell a home that something needs to be fixed and you go ahead and engage them to fix that. If you pay someone $600 or more a year, you have to issue what is called a 1099 NEC. Again, that's 1099 NEC. And uh, rules over two years ago, it used to be the 1099 miscellaneous, but IRS changed it again in 2021. And of course, in the future where it's the 1099 NEC. And before you pay someone to contract labor, you want to have them fill out what's called a W-9 form. These forms, by the way, you can get on irs.gov. That's IRS dot gov you go to their website and you could print it off and of course you might say well hey i just had someone do something uh this week and i only had it only cost 150 dollars, so that's under 600 well i still would have you fill that out because you don't know later in the year in the summers uh one or two uh closings may come up and you have them go do something then uh all of a sudden they earned over 600 for the year. Now under $600, again, you don't have to issue a 1099 NEC. Now you're gonna say, why is this important? Well, if IRS ever looked at your tax return, they're gonna see the expense, but if you didn't file the 1099 NEC, 
IRS can disallow that deduction. And the 1099 NEC are supposed to be prepared and transmitted to the IRS uh, January 31st of every year. So any expenses now in 2022, you would need to prepare that and not only give to the person next January, but also send it in to the IRS. And you also send it in with a transmittal form, which is called a 1096. Now, some of you may decide to buy books. And not only in doing real estate, but maybe in how to communicate better with people, how to sell. So uh, those books are deductible. In fact, there's three books I like reading and I'm going to share with you. Uh, I reread them every year at the beginning of the year. The first is uh, Who Moved My Cheese? The second book is Think and Grow Rich. And the third book is called The Power of Focus. A lot of times we spend 80% of our time on things that aren't important to us. And that last book kind of helps uh, highlight some activities, some methods that you do to make you more productive in your day. Some of you may pay a broker fee, a desk fee. Uh, again, if you're 1099 person, uh, those expenses are deductible. And, and of course, uh, if you purchase business cards, the business cards uh, that you pay for are deductible. Now in business gifts, you're officially only allowed to deduct $25 a person. In a married couple, RSIs is one person. And I know some of you, when you uh, sell a home, uh, you may give a gift more than that. But again, that is only uh, deductible up to $25. Now, you may have a cell phone uh, that you use. You are allowed to deduct 100% of that because you can't call, for example, uh, T-Mobile and say, hey, I'm only going to use it 50% of the time for business. Can you only charge me 50%? So you are able to deduct the full amount. And if you have a office, whether it's a physical office or a home office, which I'll talk about in a few minutes, uh, you can deduct the full cost of that line landline if it's specifically in a in primarily used just for business. And of course, if you have any type of clerical help that you have. Now, technically, if you control where some where someone works, when they work, and they have no risk of loss, they are an employee and you are uh, supposed to take out payroll taxes and also match them. Now, you may uh, use someone to help uh, do coaching to help improve your business, which I encourage someone to not only have a coach, but maybe consider having what's called a mastermind alliance. You may have other people that are in different businesses. Maybe some of you have joined some of these networking groups. Of course, they can help communicate the services you do and help give you referrals. But in a mastermind alliance, which I strongly recommend, is uh, you help each other coach each other's business. I don't know if you know... Uh, uh, the auto dealer Ford and Goodyear, believe it or not, the owners of those companies met uh, frequently in one month or one visit. They talked about one company and the next time they talked about the other company. So they help share with you ideas to help improve your business. You may, of course, uh, you're required for your license to have continuing education. You know, I believe it's every other year. So with the continuing education, these uh, courses, the materials are deductible to you. You may uh, go to a, a meeting that's out of town. So you can deduct the airfare, you can deduct the hotel room, and of course, any parking and tolls along the way. Maybe you have, sorry about that. You may have along the way, um, where you have local transportation. So you're out of town and you have a, a Uber, a Lyft, a cab, a subway, those expenses are deductible as, as part of your continuing education. Now, some of you may decide to not go somewhere, but maybe get some educational tapes. Uh, those are deductible also. Now, if you have any type of commission split that you're doing with someone and you're issuing a check to them, Again, I recommend that you fill out the W-9 form and that you um, 
issue them the 1099 NEC form at the end of the year. Now, you may have to, in your course of business, go to a, a copy place like Kinko's, or some of the brokers may charge for copies that you make. Those expenses that you pay, those are deductible. And of course, in, in trying to list a house or sell a house, uh, whether it's for the, uh, the buyer you represent or for the seller, there may be times when papers have to be uh, transmitted. They could be out of town, so you have to pay for a courier fee. You might have to pay for edit, FedEx, uh, someone like that. Those expenses, they are also deductible. And again, a, re a refresher on your dues and subscription, your MLS due, har nar all the different type of uh, dues that you have, those are deductible. Now, when you have entertainment, there has been a special rule uh, for uh, since we've had the COVID virus that if you go to a restaurant or if you even did takeout and you uh, had the meals with a customer, a client, they are 100% deductible for those. And, but you again need to document the who, what, where, when, why. Who again met with the Joneses, when, uh, what is how much, where, the place you went to, when, uh, February 23rd, 2022, why, potential client referrals source discussing a certain project. Uh, typically, if you use a receipt from a place, you have three of them. So it's really the who and the why that you have to write on there. Uh, I wanna make you aware that with changes in the law a couple of years ago, sporting events, amusements, things like that are no longer deductible. It's only the meals. Now in the course of doing your business, maybe you bought some equipment, a computer, a printer, a calculator, uh, a, a, a laptop, a desk, a chair, a file cabinet, an iPad. These are items that can be depreciated. So going, again, when you work on your return, they're on a form 4562. You will have a description uh, that you'll have a, a side list of what you bought, the date you bought it, and the amount that it cost you. Some of you may go out and uh, go somewhere like a Kinko's or somewhere like that and have to have something faxed. Uh, those expenses are deductible. Now, you may have a photographer or you may do things yourself and you have the film and the processing. Uh, if you do it yourself, those expenses are deductible. And if you have to pay a franchise fee, though, uh, some of you that have that, that is deductible also. Now, you may also have a home office and especially with COVID, a lot of people tend to have worked out of their home. There's one or two methods you can use. The first method is up to 300 square feet. You can deduct a flat $5 a square foot. So in whatever method you use, you have to know the square feet to your home that you have. And maybe you don't own a home. Maybe you're renting somewhere. So the square footage of the place that you rent and also the square footage of your home. So in my example, I'm gonna use round numbers and we know on the actual return, they won't be round numbers, but maybe you use a 10 by 10 room. So that's a hundred square feet, but you're in a thousand square foot apartment, a thousand square foot home. So a hundred over a thousand is 10%. So in the method at $5 a square foot, again, up to 300 square feet, you would be able to deduct $5 a square foot. In my example, 100 square feet times five is $500. And if you happen to be, use more space than the 300 square feet, you use 400. You still can only take the $5 on the 300 square feet. The other method is that you take your actual expenses. So you take the interest on your house. You take the taxes on your house. You take your insurance, homeowner, wind, flood. Uh, you might also look at the mortgage insurance premium that you have to uh, pay, the PMI, when you, have find, when you have loans more than, of course, 80%. You may have utilities, water, gas, electric. You may have your association dues. Then you also may have repairs to your home, the depreciation. 
And let's just say that all that added up to $10,000 in, in an example. And you had that 100 square foot room, 1,000 square foot house, which is 10%. You can actually get a $1,000 deduction. And by the way, those that are 1099 people, there's a form schedule C that you would fill out. And there's a supplement schedule that you would have for a home office. Now, I want to make you aware that if you do take the home office and you do take those expenses on your Schedule C, and I'm going to go back and just hypothetically say that $10,000 was only taxes and interest on your home, you can't also put that in an itemized deduction. So you would only be able, in that example, to carry over $9,000 to the itemized deduction form or the Schedule A. Now, some of you may have had a finance, uh, maybe you have some closings that are gonna take a while and you had to use your credit card to pay for some bills and the interest expense that you have that would be deductible. And again, uh, your internet that you use in your home office, you're able to deduct the full amount of the cost of the internet. And as a home office, another expense could be janitorial or you may, uh, I know in one or two cases where people have paid uh, someone to clean a home uh, that is uh, on a home that's being sold. That is a deduction uh, for you to take. You may decide to hire a locksmith to change the locks. So any new keys, the locksmith on a, a sale of a home that is deductible to you. Some of you may pay for some mailing lists or some lead lists. Those expenses are also deductible. And of course, you may have someone uh, that has talked to uh, a professional attorney or CPA for consulting in regard to selling or buying a home. Or you may come in to learn some different rules on, uh, for example, which I'll talk about in a little bit, uh, where someone has rental property, what impact they have when they buy it, how they can deduct things and how they sell it. You also may have, uh, of course, your license that you have to pay uh, to have your real estate business. That is deductible. You may, of course, buy lock boxes. Those expenses are deductible. And you may sometimes have a PO box where you get your mail. Uh, those expenses are deductible. Now, some of you that are, uh, may not know this, but there used to be a book called a map book where it had a roadmap to where someone can look up on how to get to different places. And yes, there are still people that use that called the key map. If you still use that, that is deductible. And of course, your MLS dues again are deductible. Now you may have different networking events that you go to. I'm very proud. I'm a past a member of the Galleria Chamber. In fact, I was uh, the vice president of community relations I had started their breakfast seminars. My first speaker was Mayor Whitmire. My second speaker that I got was Police Chief Brown before he actually uh, moved on to a higher level in our city. Some of you may have uh, office supplies uh, that you have. And of course that's deductible postage. Maybe you send out mailing, maybe you send out things. In fact, a marketing tip I'm gonna give you is if someone is kind enough to refer someone to you, spend the time and write them a thank you letter. And believe it or not, when someone, uh, you list a home or sell a home for them, why not write them a letter after you sell the home or they buy a home to write them a letter and thank them for being a client and to your family of clients and if you can help them in the future. And you might wanna write down the PS that I recommend that realtors do. The best thank you is a referral from a satisfied client. P.S. The best thank you is a referral from a satisfied client. You know, if you help sell someone home, they're very happy that you help them. If someone found their dream home and you help them find it, they're very happy. They're more attuned at that time to refer someone to you but they might forget your name. They might forget about you three, six months, a year from now. So writing that thank you letter shows a, a higher class of person that you are. And that little PS at the end, I'm very proud to tell you that I always write a, a letter to both. And I'm averaging out of 
all the times I send it for every 9.3 letters I send out, I get a new client. So maybe that works. And by the way, that book I shared with you before, Think and Grow Rich, he supposedly interviewed about 500 successful people. And they came up uh, with common traits that they have. And maybe if you just copy some of the traits that people have used that have made themselves more successful, it might rub off on you and make you more successful. So again, writing that letter to both the buyer and to the seller can make a big difference down the road. Ed, do you mind if I ask, I've got a couple questions in the chat sure. just to take a quick break. Um, just sure. on the, so you've given so much so far. You've always got so much good stuff to say. Um, there is a question um, on what expenses are deductible on a 100% basis and which ones are only 50% percentage? Okay, well, everything for the most part that I have told you so far is 100%. Okay. There are, of course, on the meals, they have to be again at a restaurant. And they made a special provision the last two years that they were 100% deductible if you either did in dining or you did takeout. Now, if you go and, and, and buy uh, other type of food and you're not eating a meal with someone, then those are only 50% deductible. So what on, about, um, like, let's say I had clients over to my house and I got a caterer. Is that not deductible because I'm having a business type? Well, party? they they specifically uh, have said 100% in, in restaurants. So that type of meal would only be 50% deductible. And the reason why they made this special provision in 2021 was due to the COVID. They were trying to have the food industry, the food service industry, to where people would go buy food from restaurants and it would help them uh, keep their businesses. They allowed that to be 100%. Okay. And so on your Schedule C, you actually see an area where it uh, has deductions for uh, 50% or 100%. Okay. OK, now I haven't talked about this yet, but uh, there are a lot of realtors that have what are called open houses, you know, where you buy uh, different things for people to have when they come view someone's home. Those expenses IRS had ruled several years back are 100 percent deductible for open houses on depreciation. When you depreciate items, you have five year property, you have seven year property, um, you have some property that's longer like. I wasn't going to go into this, but I'll go in now, is on residential. Maybe you are selling a home to someone who wants to buy homes so they can rent out to other people. A uh, home has a 27 and a half year life. And let's just hypothetically that someone buys a home for 375000 You know, if something happened to the house, if it blew away, if someone blew it up, a gas leak, whatever, the land could still be sold for something. So you can't depreciate land. And in an example on that $375,000 house, let's say that land was 100,000. So the structure of the house is 275,000. In that example, residential property is a 27 and a half year life. And if I bought that January 1st, I would take the 275,000 cost of the house, divide it by 27 and a half, I would be able to get an expense against my income from the rental of 10,000 a year. And of course, if I didn't buy it on January 1st, let's say I bought it July 1st, that year I would only get a half year, the number of days that it was uh, being rented out or trying to be rented. And just a little rules so that the people watching know, if you have income, after expenses, and you may be W-2 income, your 1099 income, interest, dividend income, capital gains, all type of income, less than 100000 you can actually utilize a loss on paper of rental property up to 25000 When you make from 100000 to 150000 you can only deduct $1 out of every two. So if someone had made 110000 then potentially $5,000 of their rental paper loss would not be deductible. It's carried forward. It's known as a passive activity loss 
and it can only be offset against future gains. However, let's just, I'm going to give an example that someone has you sell their rental property and they've rented it for a number of years. And I'm going to use different numbers in an example. Let's say that it costs $100,000 and they've taken $20,000 of depreciation in the past. Well, they got to expense 20,000. So IRS says you have to reduce that from your cost basis. So now your, your new adjusted cost basis is 100,000 minus the 20,000 of depreciation or 80,000. But along the way, you had that passive activity loss that you couldn't use everything and you were carrying forward 5,000. So when you go to sell the house, you're allowed to add that back to your adjusted basis. So now you have an adjusted basis of 85,000. So anything that you sell above that will be a capital gain. And of course, if you've held it for over a year, it would be what's known as a long-term capital gain, which has a better rate. Now, are there some other questions that you yes, want to ask? Yes, there are actually, yes, about selling. This would be written in regards to a primary, but she says, I've been told that there was a recent change that disallows the 250K or 500K on a home that you have lived in two of the past five years if you have leased it prior to sale. Is that well, if, correct? If you've leased it to prior of sale, then that rule has been around in the past to where a part of that may have to be shown as income, okay, on if you've taken depreciation on the property. Well, I guess this, I think she's asking about like a primary though, which I guess you wouldn't have. Well, been. if it's primary, then no, it's the 250 and the 500,000. If, okay. if you've not leased that out. Now, what, let's say you've leased it. So I guess what she's asking is, is, let's say you buy it and in year four, you lease it out then right. are you is that well if you've right taken away? if you've taken some depreciation and you've shown that it's a business expense then there will have to be an adjustment okay, okay. that's more a lengthy conversation than this presentation i'll have her call uh, you know on how to calculate <laughs> it but i gave the basic rules if yeah. you have rental property and you've taken depreciation and you haven't been able to use all of your loss okay and that's why it's very important to, to keep a folder and have your clients keep a folder of, of the settlement statements on any refis because you have expenses with those that add to the cost. And then, of course, people will do improvements to the home. And even if you put up window furnishing, if you put up lighting, if you put a ceiling fan in, redid the bathroom, the kitchen, a fence, a new water heater, a new AC, all these items make the home cost more and make the rental property cost more, which can lower a gain or increase a loss one day when you sell it. Okay. There, thank you. There is one more question so far. Uh, it's a completely different topic, but it's, um, it says, when do you recommend to start an S corp? I'm now a sole proprietor thinking of doing L LLC or S corp. This is a okay. realtor. Okay. Well, there's different things for different people. One thing I will tell you, an LLC uh, is normally a partnership of two or more people. I'm using my dry humor. You could tell the IRS that you have a split personality, that you're only one person. <laughs> and so uh, and let's get a, some people to raise their hands out there if that applies to them. But um, you tell the IRS that you want the umbrella of the LLC but that you're only what's known as a sole member LLC. And so what happens is uh, you still file the Schedule C on your personal tax return. It still flows through, but you don't have to do a separate partnership return. And one thing with an LLC is you're not uh, as adamant to having uh, all your records, having a formal balance sheet, a formal profit and loss statement. When you're an S corporation, when you're a, a rec, and by the way, when you are a partnership, if you do have a partner, two or more people, that return is a 1065. That return is due March 15th. And if you don't file an extension, there are penalties for late filing. Again, a 1065, a partnership of two or more people is due March 15th. If you are an S corporation, you actually have been a 
filed as a regular corporation, but you elected to be an S corporation. And in a partnership of two or more people in a S corporation, you know, when you were in school, Jennifer, you got a report card and you got it at the end of every semester. Well, the tax year for both of those typically are a December 31st year in, and each partner in a partnership, and when you're an S corporation, you're called a shareholder, you get a report card, which is called a K-1. And that would have your share of any net income, any net loss. Maybe your entity decided to invest in the stock market under that umbrella. And so you have capital gains and losses. Maybe you put some excess money you have into an account where you earn some interest. Maybe you gave to charity. So there are different things that have to be reported on that. And in an S corporation, of course, uh, one thing that happens is you have to have a more formal set of books. You have to have a balance sheet. You have to have a profit and loss statement. You also, uh, you can get a salary, but it has to be reasonable. If uh, Jennifer, you pay someone else uh, $2,500 a month and you, uh, for, that, for a position, and you all of a sudden only pay yourself $1,000 a month, you're not giving yourself reasonable compensation. And one reason why people tend to be an S corporation is that the net income from uh, the S corporation, that, in, that portion of the income is not subject to uh, payroll taxes which I'm gonna talk about a little later in my presentation. Now, oh, okay. an S corporation return is due March 15th. If you're a regular corporation, if you're an S corporation, in Texas, we don't have state income tax. We have what's called a right to do business tax. That is what's known as a Texas franchise tax. And under current law, if you're under a million one of income, of course, laws can change, uh, you owe nothing. If you have no activity, you formed it, but you didn't do anything, you still have to file the franchise report. That is due May 15th. If you don't file an extension, and even though you don't owe anything, there is a $50 penalty. If you are a year late and you haven't filed, you can forfeit your LLC, even as a sole member. You can uh, forfeit your S corporation in the state of Texas to where you're no longer a legal entity. So that's important too, if you're gonna be an LLC or you're gonna be a corporation or an S corporation, you also in Texas need to file the Texas Franchise Report. Okay, awesome. Yeah, that, no more questions. So just okay. need to get you off track, thank you. No problem. So you also may uh, hire a photographer to uh, take pictures of your home so that you can list it, uh, you know, uh, on the different sites that you have on. So that is deductible. Now you may go and have to make copies of uh, paperwork uh, in your business. So photocopies, whether you have to pay that to the broker, or you go to a place like Kinko's, uh, FedEx office, uh, those expenses are deductible. Some of you may send out postcard mailers or just send out postcards to people. Those expenses, again, the postage with it, uh, any type of shipping that you have, that's deductible. And again, if you have uh, some professional fees, uh, your attorney, your CPA, uh, graphic design, web design, things like that, those expenses are deductible. You may have promotional material that you've made up. Uh, those expenses would be deductible. If you pay someone a referral fee, that's deductible. But again, if it's $600 or more, you got to issue that 1099 NEC form. Uh, some of you may uh, pay not only desk, but may, some of you may have your own office somewhere where you have to pay rent. Those expenses are deductible. If you have repairs that you pay for to help sell a home, uh, those expenses are deductible. And maybe something breaks down. Uh, I had a problem with my computer last year and I had to end up getting a new computer. But if I had someone repair parts or, you know, I go someone, uh, IT person uh, to help fix it, those expenses are deductible. 
And again, any type of selling expense that you have, any concessions, home warranty, uh, inspection fees, uh, maybe you pay for a notary, those expenses are deductible. Now you may have some specialized uh, software that you use. Uh, even if you bought QuickBooks, uh, if you bought some other software to help you with your business, maybe a contact management uh, software, those expenses are deductible. Again, if you go out of town on business, uh, I have a client that uh, uh, that's a realtor and they uh, go three days a week because they also sell real estate, not only in Houston, but they sell it in Austin. Since Austin is a growing uh, place. Uh, sometimes they fly there. Uh, they tend to get a hotel room. If it's business related, that is deductible. Of course, any parking along the way, any tolls along the way, uh, when they're out of town, uh, if they fly, they they uh, rent a car, so that would be deductible. And again, if you use any public transportation, uh, trains, uh, subway, uh, if you use uh, cabs, uh, Uber, Lyft, things like uh, that, those expenses are deductible. And if you're at meetings out of town and you have to pay for a porter, that's deductible. In fact, I'd like to give a little travel tips. I used to give this uh, when I had a series on Fox 26 called wake up money I, I did this story about once a year is when you do airfare consider only buying the tickets it doesn't matter when you travel on tuesday and wednesday and you may notice that when you look at a site more than twice that the price goes up they're looking at your co cookies on your computer they're trying to get you to commit so a lot of uh services will start moving the price up so you know how you could possibly keep the price at the same rate? Delete your cookies on your computer. If you're gonna get a hotel room, don't call the 800 number, call the local number. When you call the 800 number, guess who's paying for that call, Jennifer? You are, because they're gonna charge you a little bit more every night to help defray the cost of that inbound call. Mm -hmm. And some people may decide to go at the last minute, maybe you wanna stay go to a meeting and it's at a particular hotel and they say the rooms are full, consider asking them if they have an out of order room, O-U-T of order. See hotels take rooms off the of reservations because there's a stain on the carpet, a leaky faucet, a running toilet, patch the sheetrock. I remember one time I went to a meeting and I got an out of order room and it was a running toilet and the room was gonna be $195 a night. Well, when I got that room, I asked for a concession. I got the room for $75. And of course, if you're traveling, I recommend that you don't travel with fancy luggage because a lot of people come in, you know, on the limos from the airport and a bellhop wants to handle as many customers coming in. And so they put the luggage on their luggage cart. And if there is a thief and Jennifer, you got a Gucci bag and got a beat up bag, guess which bag the thief's going to go after. So those are, yeah. So there's just some little travel tips that hopefully it helps. And just for the record, if you take your favorite CPA, it's always deductible. I make sure of that. Okay. <laughs> and I do have one quick question about okay. Christmas cards sent to clients. Those are hundred percent deductible, the postage and the card. Yes. yes. Okay. Uh, and it, but the business gift, is only uh, $25 if they bought a gift for somebody. You know, what, if, what if the gift, what if anything you send has logo? Like what if you get something branded with your logo and it's, con I, I heard then it's considered a promotional item. Is well, it could be a promotional item. Like if, if you did uh, the, the knives that I've seen you do or someone prints a book. And by the way, another thing, you know, like with laundry, a lot of people say, well, I want to deduct, you know, I got to wear a suit. So I want to have that clean. That's not deductible. But I know there are some real estate offices where they have a logo. And so that's considered a uniform. And if you get a uniform clean, that's deductible. Okay. Gotcha. And by the way, there is one exception to gifts. If you buy your favorite CPA a gift, it's always deductible. My shirt size was small. I gained some weight. It used to be tiny, but don't tell my wife. Okay. So if you could, there is actually a question just about just kind of succinctly. I know I did post in the chat, the handout, but if you could just summarize a couple of important changes for this year, that would be great. 
Okay. I, I think we'll have a little bit of time if I can go through some more stuff and then I'll talk about the changes. Okay. But, but one thing I will say is if you uh, have any loans uh, that were forgiven for student loans under the current law, uh, the forgiven loans are not deductible. There's a sunset, I believe it's 2026. I don't have it memorized. It's in the handout. It will be fully taxable later on. Uh, if you have unemployment income, in 2020, you were allowed to exclude a portion of that. They didn't continue that. And so in 2021, if you have unemployment, that is uh, going to be 100% taxable. On uh, child care credit, I did stories on 13 and uh, 26 about this. People got advanced credit payments. If you had children under six, you got $300. Six to 16, you got 250. And so to help people with their cash flow and their needs during the COVID virus, they did advance payments from July 1st through uh, December 31st. They have stopped that for 2022. You don't get those payments anymore. But something important is when you go to do your return, you are given a tax credit of uh, $3,000 uh, for a child six to 17 and $3,600 for a child under six. Well, you got advanced payments. So you should have gotten a letter in January where they told you how much the advance payments were. You have to reduce the credit on your tax return. A lot of people are gonna miss that. And IRS only came out within the last week saying they made errors on that letter. So even though you have a number on that letter, you might go back in your bank and you might double check, or maybe you had a check sent to you because they didn't have your uh, routing number and your account number and add up from July through December how much you got on your children. And another important thing is maybe last May, you didn't get the recovery rebate. Your income could have been higher and maybe uh, someone went into real estate because they were laid off at the company they worked for. So IRS based it on a higher income for you and, and your spouse if you filed a, a married joint return. But in 2021, your income was low enough to where you would be eligible for that stimulus check last May of $1,400 a person. Please listen closely. On the second page of the 1040, there's a line for recovery rebate credit. If you didn't get that uh, $1,400 and you were eligible for it, or maybe you're the uh, recovery rebate was like going up a roller coaster. The more money you make, that rebate amount gets smaller and smaller to where you're not eligible for it. You can actually get it on the tax return that you file for 2021. And if you do get a refund and you're in real estate and uh, maybe you start it this year, maybe you start it late in 21 and you feel that you're on track to make a lot more money, and maybe you're no longer working at that old company where they took out income tax, and that's part of the reasons why you got the refund, you might consider applying the uh, refund you got to your 2022 taxes. And I'm jumping ahead a little bit, but if you're self-employed now, you're new to real estate, and you're making money, no one's taking taxes out. So you have to pay in taxes yourself. Because you know when you work for someone, if you got paid twice a month or every other week, they took out for Social Security, Medicare tax, federal income tax. Well, now the IRS wants you to pay in four times a year. So the first estimated payments due April 15th. The second one's due June 15th. The third one's doing September 15th. And so you have money to buy Jennifer and me a gift at Christmas. They don't ask you before Christmas. So the fourth payment for 2022 would be due January 15th of 2023. Because if they had you pay before Christmas, people would have less money and retail sales would be down with people paying their taxes. Uh, I'm trying to think of another one or two real fast. Capital gain uh, rates, the thresholds to where it goes to 20% in my handout has increased a little bit. Uh, the educational uh, break of being able to take a deduction for uh, tuition um, 
that is no longer eligible in 21, though the uh, different tax credits uh, for going to college uh, for your tuition, they still are in effect. And what I'd like to do is kind of go back, if it's okay, Jennifer, to some of my expenses that I was going to talk about. And then we have time, I'll go into more of the changes. Okay. Yeah. I just, I know that, uh, you know, some changes, that's kind of how we advertised it. So I know some people right. are going to be right. concerned about that. So yeah, we've got, um, um, we've got 25 minutes left. So, okay. Uh, of course, if you pay for a virtual assistant, that's deductible. If you have a website, the cost of the website, that's deductible. Now, you know, when you're a realtor and you're contract labor, no one's taking taxes out. So Jennifer, if you paid me $100 salary as an employee, I'm gonna pay in Social Security and Medicare taxes 7.65%. You, the employer, have to match it. So in reality, you spent $107.65 on my $100 salary. Well, when people are 1099 income, contract labor, they technically are considered both the employee and the employer. So you have to pay in 15.3%. That's a 7.65 uh, times two. So hypothetically, if someone made a $100,000 net income, that's $15,300 that they have to pay in. There's a form SE that you would fill out if you're doing your own tax return. Now, what about you, um, regarding virtual assistants? So uh -huh. on the 1099, I mean, virtual assistants, let's say they're virtual and they're in another country. They don't, they don't need to get a 1099. It doesn't matter to them. Well, so, technically, technically, you're supposed to issue a 1099, just anyone $600 or more. Okay. Okay. And then what about if you hire a social media company to help you? You're supposed to issue them the 1099. Technically, well. anyone who's not a corporation, you're supposed to issue. So if someone was an LLC, you know, technically you're supposed to. A uh, corporation, you don't have to. But I do have uh, some business clients that ask me for my federal ID number and they issue me a 1099. Because IRS wants to make sure that people report their income. In fact, uh, on uh, TV, uh, one of the segments I did, IRS actually has a new tax form that they want you to report your illegal money that you get. And I remember the, the, the newscaster asked me, do you think people are going to fill that out? And of course, I said, time will tell. I find it hard to believe that people will fill that out. So when someone uh, pays that extra 7.65%, this is something that people will miss on their return. They, you as an employer, Jennifer, get to deduct the 7.65% that you had to pay on top of that $100 salary. So on the Schedule 1, a contract labor person can deduct the uh, portion that they match on Social Security and Medicare tax. Now, when someone's self-employed, they could put money away to retirement. If you had were in a retirement account during the year uh, before you became a realtor, or maybe you're part-time doing real estate, or you have a spouse and you're married filing jointly, there are different thresholds on what you could put away uh, for just a regular IRA. And again, you have up to April 15th of 2022 to put money, if you're eligible, into an IRA and get a deduction for it on your 2021 tax return. Now, there's a separate type of IRA called an SEP IRA. I have a nickname for it, Self-Employed Person IRA. Legally, it's called Simplified Employer Pension IRA. And someone, there's a formula you go through, and just as a rough number, you could put away 18 to 20% of your net. So hypothetically, you made 100,000, someone could actually go open it now in 2022 fund it and get a deduction for it on their 21 tax return if they do it before April 15th. If they're on extension, they have up until the time they file the return uh, or no later than October 15th if they're filing their return late. Now, you have clients who have moving expense. Moving expense is no longer deductible. There is an exception if someone's in the military and they have to move from one base to another. You have mortgage interest on your primary residence and your second home. Any uh, 
mortgages after December 14th of 17, the maximum mortgage you can have on those is up to $750,000. If you had a mortgage before that, you can uh, have up to a million. And by the way, a little tip that you could possibly share with uh, the person buying a home, if they have a 30 year mortgage and they were to pay one extra payment a year, and I'm using this example without escrowing insurance and taxes, they would knock off approximately nine years off the life of the mortgage. If you have a 15th, uh, excuse me, a 15 year mortgage and you paid one extra payment a year, you would knock off approximately two years off the life of the mortgage. But when they make that extra payment, make sure on the payment coupon, or if they do it on the internet, say apply to principal. Otherwise, it's just going to be more money put into the escrow account and it's not going to have any benefit to anybody. Uh, for itemized deductions, you're only allowed to deduct up to $10,000. So if you pay in more, you can only deduct 10 under this Build Better Back Act. They were trying to have a higher number. Uh, hopefully that portion will be approved because there were three states. Uh, for example, New York, California, New Jersey, where they couldn't, you take the higher of sales tax in addition to your property tax or your state income tax. And the average state income tax in New York was over 40,000. So here all of a sudden the people couldn't deduct the property tax, the sales tax, and they were limited to 10,000. Now, if someone has under 10,000 and you also use a tax table, you're allowed to do big purchases on top of that. So maybe somebody bought a car during the year. Maybe they went out and bought a washer, dryer, refrigerator, you know, furniture. You might share with them that if they're below 10,000 and they do itemize, that they can take those sales tax in addition. And if you had someone maybe toward the end of the year that bought a newly constructed home, see if you can get the builder to tell you how much they paid with sales tax. Because see what happened on the purchase of that house, they bought lumber, they bought appliances, lighting, and they paid sales tax on those items. So your buyer may be able to deduct those if they had enough to itemize. Now listen closely, because this is something that a lot of realtors will miss. A couple of years ago, they cut the rates for corporate income tax down to 21%. Would it be fair to small businesses, you have an opportunity of getting an extra deduction on your net income of 20%. Now on my handout, I had that there's a phase out period, but if your income is below those thresholds and hypothetically, again, someone made a hundred thousand, there of course would pay social security and Medicare tax on the hundred thousand, but there'll be a special deduction to where they can deduct 20% of that or an additional 20,000. So that amount, which is known as a qualified business uh, deduction and also the half of the social security and Medicare tax are the two most common things that people miss when sometimes they have an inexperienced tax preparer do it or they try to do the return themselves. So again, make sure that those are on your tax return. Again, at the back of my original handout, I have my VITA information about me, and I also have the 8822 and the 8822B for businesses for change of address. And those two forms, by the way, you have the taxpayer mail in to the IRS. So again, on uh, tax changes, you wanna make sure that if you got the advanced childcare uh, credit payments from July, through December last year, then on the form 8812, when you do the return, you have to reduce the credit by that amount. And if you don't, it could get your return kicked out. If you do get a refund and you do want the payment sent to you, I encourage you to have a direct deposit to your route, to your bank account. But please, when you do your return or you have someone do the return, double check their figures. People are known to get uh, dyslexia where they transpose numbers. So especially if you're gonna have it sent to your bank account, double check your routing number and double check your bank account number 
to make sure that they're correct. I have a quick On question about a home office. Ed, there's yes. a question in the chat. Yes. Um, with a home office, can I deduct 100% of the amount I pay for software that I need to use on the computer, even if I use it a little bit for personal, like when they work from home? Okay, on a home office, it is 100% deductible if it's used for business. Okay. And also you may have some outside services I didn't mention, maybe someone does centralized showing or something like that. Uh, th those expenses, you know, for those fees are 100% deductible. But like Quicken, Zoom, yes, I mean, let's yes, say they only yes. have one computer. Yes, that's that that is deductible, and you don't you don't take a ratio of it because again, Zoom won't let you just pay for the portion you use for business. You just pay for the full amount. Okay, gotcha. Thank you. Were there any other questions or? No, that for now that's good. Okay, um, if I may, as another marketing tip, uh, I did a story. Uh, they may air it in February. A lot of people don't keep their goals because they don't know how to set goals. So you might want to write down the word smart. You want to be specific. You want to be measurable. You want it to be attainable. You want it to be relevant. You want to have a time frame. A goal I had uh, a year ago was to reduce my weight by 50 pounds. And again, Never use the word lose. No one likes losing. So that was specific. I will reduce my weight one pound a week. Is that measurable? And also, is that attainable? And is that relevant? Of course, I wanted to improve my health. And you know, when you were in school, if you had an exam on Thursday morning at 11 o'clock, you may have studied earlier that week, the night before that morning, or never studied. But if you didn't have a goal to learn about that subject before 11, you may never have studied. So it's important for you to write down, why are you in business? And it's to fund the lifestyle you want to live. So I recommend to people, and I'm doing a little marketing tip here, is I'd like you all to be movie producers. And you know, when they make a movie, they have a storyboard, opening scenes, scenes along the way, final scenes. They know it's a draft. They know it's not perfect. They know they might edit it. So a movie I'd like you to make is called The Rest of Your Life. And if you're a morning person, do it in the morning, afternoon, in the afternoon, evening person in the evening. And when you do this exercise, I also want you at the same time to be a photographer. Jennifer, if we were best friends or families, we could probably plan a trip this year. Let's go to San Antonio, Vegas this year. Let's go on a cruise next year. But 6, 10, 20 years from now, that's hard to envision. So yearly for the next five years, and then five-year periods of time, 6 to 10 years from now, 11 to 15 years from now, write down what do you see yourself doing, what places you're going to go, what people you help, what debt you pay off, what money you save, and last but not least, what money you make. Because the reason you work is to fund the lifestyle you want to live. And most people spend more time worrying about things than setting goals of making things happen. Uh, on some more changes during the year, if someone has a large enough estate, the amount uh, to where you pay no estate tax has increased some. Um, during the year, uh, people that are expats, US citizens working overseas, if, if you have a spouse that does that, the amount has jumped now uh, for last year to 108,700. Uh, if you have a nanny at your home, you are supposed to pay in social security and Medicare tax. You're technically supposed to issue them a W-2 and take out income tax. There's a Schedule H that you need to prepare. Uh, the threshold uh, went up to $2,300 uh, for 2021. Again, mileage rates that you have, that uh, has been lowered for 2022 to 56 cents a mile. Another deduction, by the way, Jennifer, that people forget is your health insurance. So I may have health insurance. I may have vision insurance. I may have dental insurance. If I have positive net income, 
on my Schedule C, my 1099 income after expenses, and I've subtracted half of my Social Security and Medicare tax, and I still have positive income, then I could deduct on the Schedule 1 the premiums that I pay for my health insurance, my vision, my dental insurance. Again, that's an extra deduction that people forget. Those are the main deductions that I have. Are there some other questions that people have? No, I think uh, I don't have any currently, but I, um, you know, if there are any things that weren't, now's a good time. We're going to wrap it up the last home stretch here. If, um, if I could throw out two things real fast. Sure. I'm, I'm hoping to restart. I stopped the last two years due to the virus. This would be my 40th year where I have a clothing toy food drive. The items go to Star Hope. I ho I've helped a little over 383,000 due to the kindness of people in my community and the city. And it's usually the first Sunday in December. If you on the information I gave you can send me an email uh, or Jennifer, if you have emails of everyone, if you forward it to me, usually on Tuesday mornings around 8.30, I, about 45 weeks out of the year, update people on different things they need to know about or different tax changes. Okay. Like I even told people how they could get the free COVID masks, you know, bef uh, before they publicly announced it. So there's different sources I have. Uh, the COVID testing, I mean, uh, kits, you know, from the government. Uh, so I talk about a host of different topics. And one thing that you said I could share, hopefully the end of the, this year or next year, I was a uh, party to a film coming out. It's a comedy called Furry Fortune, where you have twins, they have a dog, the dog and the twins go out, the dog jumps through a rainbow. It's a comedy again. It starts shedding money, the family goes crazy, they buy a whole bunch of stuff. A nosy neighbor finds out he and his son steal the dog. The kids band together to get the dog back. Um, the neighbor, by the way, Jennifer, guess what he does for a living? Mm. He's an IRS agent. <laughs> that's funny. That's that's good CPA humor right there. <laughs> yes. And my wife wouldn't let me go. I could have potentially gone to Hollywood when they filmed it. Right now it's in post-production. I could have been an extra on the film. And my true dream, I could have been an IRS agent. <laughs> that's super fun. <laughs> so I'm going to wrap. Uh, I, I, I did promise that I was going to give just a couple of nuggets on in lending. What sure. is going on with um, uh, with tax returns. So there's FHA loans and there's conventional. On FHA loans, hands down, no matter what, you have to have two years tax returns. There's just no way around it. So some of the clients in your database uh, for you realtors, we've been waiting patiently for the tax time to come so that they can file 2021. So we're, we're, we're seeing people now making more money after COVID. 20, 19 and 20 weren't great years for some people. Um, Ed, I do have a question for you because I need to know this. Um, what's the earliest date that the IRS will allow you to file the tax return? I did story on both 13 and 26. Uh, Monday a week ago was the first day that you could file a return. Now, there may be some forms uh, that have not officially been approved to transmit. Okay. Got you. Okay. Okay, but some of my self-employed, just basic Schedule C people, you know, I'm, I'm needing them to file. So, um, and they need to e-file, by the way, because we uh, uh, can then prove that they filed it. The IRS will return on email that they filed. Right, and um, if they need help, we e-file. And of course, if they manually prepared it and they need a letter uh, for the underwriter, we prepare that letter where they give okay, us great. copies of the previous two years. Okay, great. So there is a loophole, uh, not a loophole, but just a guideline on a conventional loan. When someone has been self-employed five plus years in that, uh, you know, profession, um, we can, well, if they're Schedule C, we have to get a letter from the CPA that they're Schedule C filer for five plus years. Uh, if it's a business and you have an S corp, et cetera, it gets a little muddy because let's say you're let's say you're Schedule C and then you're doing the same business but you flip to S corp. 
we could possibly combine those two years if it's the same line of business. That's where the CPA comes in handy to explain. Um, we can do just one year of returns. So for some people that makes or breaks what they can qualify for. So definitely check with your favorite loan officer, whether it's me or somebody else uh, at that time. And then also we got to get the CPA looped in to just see what kind of letters are available and all that good stuff. So if I may, Jennifer, on the letter that the underwriter may record, uh, ask for, have the person, if we don't prepare it, uh, put funds taking out of the business will not have an impact on the further operations of the business. Yeah. Yeah. We always tell them what we needed to say. Sometimes we don't need that anymore, but, but yes, it's, it's uh yeah. If you're using money from the business for down payment, if you're a, if you're a sole proprietor, there's certain different assurances that we need. So the hardest part is the self filers. We have the hardest time with that, with people that don't, you know, they definitely need, need to prepare um, for all these letters and stuff, but um, I am going to send an email to everybody that came Ed, um, and then I'll ask them to email you directly to, to get on your email list. Um, you know, definitely. And thank you everybody. I'm also going to email y'all this presentation so that you can revisit it with all this really good information and we'll hang out just for a couple of minutes. Um, if there's any last, last questions for Ed while you have him live and in person. So thanks Ed. for Thank you. I want to wish everybody three words and that's many happy returns. <laughs> that's right. That's right.